Hey, this is Jody with WeldingTipsAndTricks.com with another weekly video. We're TIG welding today. TIG welding cold rolled steel. That's just like 1010 to 1020 uh, plain carbon steel, cold rolled finished. I'm going to sand it down anyway. I'm going to be welding on shiny bright metal and there's a reason for that because we're going to be talking about heat input. Now, I want to give credit where credit's due because Lincoln Electric put out a video very similar to what I'm doing today a year or two ago and one of their instructors uh, at their school, Carl Hose, very good instructor. He did a really good job of breaking this down. I just think maybe I've got a few things to add to it. And hey, that's how we all learn, right? We just all chip in and, and uh, give our two cents worth. So going to be welding lap joints today. We're going to be talking about heat input, what affects heat input, what you can do to affect heat input, and some things you may not have considered. So let's do it. I clean these pieces of 11 gauge with a, with a uh, flap disc. So I'm, I'm welding on clean, shiny, bright metal. And part of the reason is so we can see the discoloration and the extent of the heat zone very well. You could do it, you can see it anyway on cold rolled steel, but we'll just be able to tell exactly where the discoloration is when, with this all nice and clean. I'm starting here. The first one I'm going to run it at 80 amps. I'm using this big old 26 air cooled torch, but with a stubby gas lens on it. And I'm using 1 16th, that's 1.6 millimeter filler wire. And I'm going to use that uh, throughout here just to keep everything the same. So I'll take a few dry runs here and I've got hash marks on there at three inches and I'm starting in the middle so I don't get any effects of heating the end up and I don't get any effects of going to an end either. Now at 80 amps it takes this thing like nearly five seconds to puddle enough to where I can join it and get and get moving and that's a bit of a problem. It's a problem on stainless steel, actually, and, and some other metals. It's not so much of a problem here. It, this, this 80 amps will weld this, this 11 gauge steel, which is, which is roughly 120 to 125 thousandths thick or 3 millimeters thick, thick. But you can see how slow it goes. It's a very slow process, a little too slow for, for my tastes. If, I if you just had to weld something and you only had a little 90 amp inverter or something, you could do it. But it took a whole minute to go 3 inches here. And that's just that's just too long. Decent looking weld, but it just took it just took forever. And you got a, I got a big heat mark there going out to the end. And now we're going to run one at 120 amps. Everything's the same, same filler wire and all that kind of stuff. Same tungsten size. I'm using a 332nd, which is 2.4 millimeter, 2% 2 lanthanated electrode. And see, I get a puddle right away. I don't have to wait for, to establish a puddle and I can get moving and something a lot more reasonable. Plus you can see that the puddle is going down into the root of the joint and going all the way up to the corner which is just kind of a matter of preference. I like to fill in fillet wells like this on sheet metal all the way up to the corner. I've just seen a lot of them fail that haven't in the industries that I've worked in. Now you can see right away that the the extent of this coloration is less. So I've got less heat input here with 120 than I did using only 80 amps. So right away we can see that amperage isn't the only thing that affects that affects heat input. Now there is somebody asked me just the other day about what about this one amp per one thousandths rule? Does that hold true on up into three eighths and half inch thickness? Well it doesn't. It, my, my, uh, my opinion is the cutoff's about 160. This is a big chunk of metal here. It's some 4140 high strength steel and uh, I welded this thing at 160 amps and in fact found out that going much higher on the amperage was detrimental because it diluted too much of the base metal into the filler metal. I was using ER70S2 filler metal. That was the spec on this job. And I, I just ran multiple passes, 160 amps, to get, the, uh, to get the required fillet size. And that worked out well for me. But to, to, in answer to the question again, it's a good rule of thumb for sheet metal up to, you know, easily up to an eighth of an inch thick, 101 amp per one thousandths or, or 40 amps per one millimeter would be a good rule of thumb. But it's just a starting, starting point and there's a cutoff. And that cutoff for me is about 160 amps. Now I'm going to weld one at 140 amps. And I got to get everything just right and get ready to put that filler rod in there. I'm, I'm set the machine at 140 and going full pedal. So I'm moving on out here. I've even sped it up uh, with the film a little bit more. But this only took me 25 seconds to weld the three inches. That's a that's a far cry from the whole minute it took on on 80 amps. And you can see that I've got a little bit less discoloration, a little bit less heat zone or or a heat discolored zone than either one of the other two. So there's a there's a point at which uh, there'll be a cutoff. But generally speaking, travel speed is the biggest 
the biggest factor. You just got to be able to keep up with it. And what if I use a lay wire technique here and just fly? I don't even put any, I don't even dip it. I'm just uh, running over that 1 16th wire just about as quick as I can at 160 amps. Now you could actually go much hotter and much quicker than this. In fact, this is the way a lot of automated applications are, are done in, in industry, like tube mills. Uh, welding on, on seam tubing is done in the, in the uh, feet per minute, not inches per minute range. So it's, it just doesn't provide the kind of look that, that people uh, have come to want as far as the stacked dimes look. But it is a quick way of, of uh, getting something done. You can see the heat zone is very narrow at 160 amps because I picked up the travel speed so much. This is just, I just did this just to show 160 amps versus 80 amps. This has got a much narrower heat zone than the 80 amp or the 100 or the other two that I welded, in fact. I mean, I think that's the way to do it. I'm just doing this for the, the purposes of an instructional video just to talk about heat input and how a travel speed really, really is the big player. The formula for heat input goes something like this. Volts times amps times 60, and that would be in all in parentheses. You do that, do that equation first, divided by travel speed. Looks something like this. So big deal, right? <laughs> Have I lost you? Don't worry, we're not gonna go deep into that stuff. Just wanna talk about things that affect heat input. Voltage affects heat input, and that's your arc length. Amperage, that's your current, and you control that with your foot pedal and or the machine setting. Uh, so you got voltage and amperage and then travel speed. Travel speed's a big one, probably the, the biggest one. You can really reduce heat input by increasing travel speed. You can increase heat input by slowing the travel speed down. A good example of this is, is holding too long an arc. When you hold too long an arc in TIG welding, you increase the voltage. You don't pinpoint the heat. It takes a little bit longer to melt everything. Things don't kind of go together like they should. Because you're fanning the heat out there, you're not directing the heat, so you're slowing travel speed down, and you're increasing voltage, and you're you know doing all kinds of things. The rod is balling up and blobbing in there, and you get a you get an oxidized looking surface because the the metal is still terrifically hot while the argon leaves it, and just not what you're looking for from a TIG weld. Contrast that with same amperage here. I'm still using 100 amps here. I just tightened up the arc. Now everything is going much better and much quicker. And it's going more like TIG welding should, and I'm putting less heat into the part, which is usually a good thing. Now, sometimes stuff is in your way, and that slows your travel speed down, or you're out of position. Vertical uphill or overhead or, or something round that you just have trouble getting around, that's going to slow your travel speed. So let's set up a vertical uphill lap joint here. I'm going to run this at 110 amps. Now, doing a joint like this... It's, it's kind of hard to, to find a place to prop. Now, I'm, this is a shameless plug for my TIG finger here, but stick with me. I think you'll, you'll enjoy what you see. You can see it's got more layers on one side than it does on the other. So that the, air, the side that you're going to prop on, that's the one you want to choose to uh, use the, the one with more layers on right here. And also, it's long enough that you can double it over and get it even twice the amount of, of uh, protection there. And so that's what I'm going to do here. I'm going to rest it right against that edge. I'm just going to slide it right up the joint as I weld this, this three inch run here. And for vertical joints, I have found, even though this is a big old 26 torch, I've found turning it upside down like that is a lot more comfortable for me and I'm, I'm a lot less tired at the end of the day if I have to do this kind of thing. But 110 amps is about right for a vertical joint here. 120, I would, I would have a hard time keeping up with that. So you've got to consider that when you're out of position as far as the amperage that you, that you select. You're going to need a little bit less amperage to get the weld done, just you really can only handle a certain amount of amperage because you can't keep up with it because you can't keep up with the travel speed because it's a little awkward. It's not like laying it flat on the bench. Now 110 amps is adequate for this vertical uphill. You can watch the front of that puddle. You can see it's sinking into the root of the joint. It's consuming the whole corner there on the uh, 11 gauge. So it's about right. But you can also see how hot that, that edge gets where I'm propping because it's red hot right next to me and I'm just following that thing up and, and uh, I can hang there all day long like this, whereas otherwise I'd probably be screaming right now and throwing the torch across the room or something like that, So, or slinging the glove off or something like that. I don't even have to worry about not hanging around and getting good post flow because not even warm yet. So just really helps on joints like this. You see that huge heat mark there. Another reason for that, it took me 41 seconds to run, make that, that three inch run, but another reason for that big heat discolored areas, I'm not laying on the bench and I don't have any quench effect from it laying on the bench. So it's out in free state like that. It's going to get hotter, more heat input. 
and also it being out of position. But it, it still welded okay. There's it compared to the 120 amp welded on the bench, 110 amps going vertical because it was slower, bigger heat zone. Also on joints like this that are round and out of position like this, I'm using a scratch start air-cooled rig here. You can use travel speed to your advantage there because you're going to start off, you're only going to have one amperage here. You don't have, you don't have the, the uh, luxury of adjusting it like with a foot pedal or whatever. So you start off a little bit slow, heat builds up, and then you increase your travel speed to compensate because you've only got one amperage. And, and we, we know already that travel speed is a big player. So here you're just speeding up and slowing down using travel speed to control your heat. It's like I say, this is a scratch start air-cooled rig, no amperage control, just is what it is, so you have to use travel speed. Things get too hot, you can speed up, and, and, it, and it really helps a lot, and that's, travel speed is, is the big factor in controlling heat input. Now, don't want to make anybody afraid of heat input, or like it's a bad thing, it's just something to be concerned with, because it can affect the properties of the weld and the metal. Now, I'm welding cold rolled steel here on this bench, so it's going to affect it less than most things. It will have a somewhat of a softening effect on it because the, the grains in that cold rolled metal will recrystallize in a certain area and soften up and be basically an annealed area, and you'll lose the benefit of the cold working. Also, when you start welding on things like this big chunk of 4140 or high strength steel with higher carbon and things like that, now heat input tends to have a bigger effect and that's why you, you need to prove out a welding procedure. That's the need for welding procedures because you got to know that uh, you're, you're controlling heat input within a certain set of parameters and the only way to do that is to run tests and, and, and whatnot. So also on aluminum heat input affects the properties of the metal a lot. Typically when you overheat aluminum you're gonna basically take it back to its annealed stage which is the softest stage in a certain area right around the weld. So that's why a lot of people will set up pulse parameters for aluminum to limit the heat input. Just a quick reminder that I've got the 2013 DVD set available now at WeldmongerStore.com. It's a four disc set. Every video that I posted in 2013 took four discs to get it all on. Got a nice little menu on the back so you can see what exactly is on each disc. That's available at WeldmongerStore.com. Also, you saw me using that TIG finger quite a bit in this video. <laughs> I'd love for you to grab one. If you think this is something that would help you, by all means, try one out. I get zero emails of people that are disappointed that they bought a TIG finger. So, see you next week.